Hi everybody, I'm Chloe and this is Dante. And we've also got Elliot here from Scroll. Hi. And we're going to have a really interesting conversation today. Yeah, we're going to be talking about stuff like consent, navigating online relationships, image-based abuse um, and coercion and kind of how to report that stuff to eSafety. And we've got a fantastic special guest with us today, uh, Chanel Contos, who is a sexual um, education activist and founder of Teach Us Consent. And she has basically redefined um, sexual consent education in Australia. So welcome, Chanel. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be speaking to the three of you today. Yeah, we're very excited to have you here talking to us today. We wanted to start the conversation by asking, what is consent or how would you define consent? It's a really good question. It's a really hard question for someone who thinks about consent a lot to answer. So, you know, consent means agreeing to do something. That's how we see it in legal terms. That's how we see it when we tick a box on a website, all those sort of things. Um, but to me, consent goes one step further and it's all about understanding how the person you're interacting with, the person whose decisions, um, your decisions affect how they feel about um, that situation. And when we're talking about consent, there's a few things that are really important. So consent always has to be freely given. That means if it's not an option to say no, then saying yes doesn't count. Um, you can't be coercive. You can't be talked into it through guilt or manipulation or all these other factors. You know, when you start talking about all the specifics of all well, the things to do with consent, you know, it can be withdrawn at any time and um, consent specific. You can agree to do one thing and not another thing, or you can say that you want to do something on one day and not another day. Um, but ultimately what we're dealing with here is um, empathy and respect for another person when we're trying to navigate consent. Mm. Absolutely. And how do, you, how do you think that kind of shifts when we put that into kind of like an online lens? Because I think especially like a lot of the younger generation coming up now, um, that consent definition in an online sense, it almost gets even more muddy in terms of what is consent, what isn't consent, what does need consent, what doesn't need consent when you're building these relationships online? A hundred percent. I think it's because, you know, young people and people in general have a pretty good grasp on how to navigate and exist in the real world because we've constantly seen it happen by, you know, older people and our parents and we've seen it enacted over and over again. But the online world and the extent of the online world for young people today, um, you know, I feel like men... Elliot and other people and both of you as well on that kind of brink borderline of we, we grew up in the technology age you know we yeah. grew up with the real world and the online world being morphed in terms of how we develop relationships and how we see people if we have a really good conversation with someone in a chat room at night you still feel closer to them the next day when you go to school which is something yes. that would be quite foreign to like a lot of our parents and I think that that means people aren't remembering that the people in the online world are also very real people um you know for example image-based abuse if someone if you find someone's naked photo and share it or someone sends it to you and you share it on you probably wouldn't open the change room curtain yeah, at a right, public yeah. venue and flash someone who's naked because you know that that's not the right thing to do um and it would be pretty embar embarrassing and a mortifying experience to think that you would like put that embarrassment onto someone and do something that out of character but it becomes very normal when it's cyber because that real person isn't there. And how do you think it can, it can get a bit muddy, as Dante said, and a bit tricky navigating consent um, online and especially through images? Like you see, you hear a lot about people taking, you know, upskirting or or taking photos of people on public transport or airdropping them um, sexual photos without anybody's consent or even consent to receive the photo in the first place. So. In that sense, how do you think that talking about consent can really help that conversation and that dialogue? 100%. Just to add to that as well, like unsolicited dick pics is like a massive, yes, exactly. um, a massive aspect of that, especially with Snapchat and stuff like that. And yeah, I mean, I think, I think that the problem is we're not, oh, it's good that we're doing it right now, but we're not often enough having these conversations. They're not in the public sphere. We haven't um you know the way that we have official curriculum and the way that parents think they need to speak to their kids and all that sort of thing it hasn't really caught up fast enough with how quickly things have changed and how quickly they continue to change I think that people forget that 
how we enact respect and how we expect to be treated in day-to-day life is just as important in the online world, given that it does um, does have an impact on very, very real people. We need to fix that by education and changing norms and, you know, not kind of letting the internet be this crazy, wild, you can do anything on it. But remember that when there's a, you know, username attached to that and when there's a person attached to that, um, that these are actions that are real. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. And how do you think that the idea of consent for some people can often shift when in a relationship? Because can, it seems like consent can sometimes be only spoken about, you know, in terms of one-off interactions with somebody. Whereas in a relationship, when, say, you are committed to someone, expectations can, you know, they change. So, so how do you think that that conversation um, affects how we talk about um, consent? Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the big kind of, like, pushbacks in this movement was, like, so often old men being like, what, so I have to ask my wife if I want to have sex with her every time I want to have sex with her. And um, it's kind of like, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't need to, you know, sit her down and have a conversation saying, hey, honey, do you feel like doing this tonight? But we gauge consent not just through words but through, you know, previous actions, empathy, body language, um, attitude, you know, how much someone's, you know, leaning into a situation, spying, all those sort of things. So when we're talking about consent in relationships, um, you know, there's got to be a default understanding of respect there. Like, for example, if someone has sent another person a naked photo in the past and said, you know, specifically don't show this to anyone and, and or like this is just for you or something, and then two weeks later they send you another photo but don't specify this is just for you, you need to assume that that photo is meant just for you and that forwarding that on to anyone else would be breaking consent, the consent of that person and the way um, that that Im- image was meant to be used, meaning that you are engaging in image-based abuse if you do so. So remembering that just because you're in a relationship with someone, you have an ongoing relationship with someone, that they, they don't owe you anything. Um, you're not entitled to images of them or sexual activity from them or any of those sort of things. I think you, and I think you touched on a really important point there because I think especially for young people, um, we are so quickly building relationships online whether that's sexual relationships or even just friendships through, you know, apps and even online dating apps and stuff like that. What, what, do you, what would you kind of say if you're, if you're a young person and you're meeting people online and you're kind of trying to navigate through that world and build relationships in that online space, what would be some like red flags that you would look for kind of surrounding building those online relationships? Yes, there's a few main red flags in that situation um for example if someone's asking personal information that's not really relevant to the situation you know if they're asking where you live or like your birth date or um you know specifics of things that you don't necessarily want to give to them it'd be quite normal to say to someone like oh yeah I live in this part of Sydney like the suburb or my birthday is in February whatever but if someone's you know getting really specific with details about you um, you know, it may be a sign that they're you know, either trying to scam you or they're trying to learn too much about you or that they can investigate you further and that sort of thing. Um, and also if someone's, you know, pushing your boundaries in terms of comfort, like if you're meant to meet someone out, you know, in a public safe place at a restaurant and they're saying, no, 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 come to my house instead for the first time you meet them. Or if they're pushing to get information out of you um, to, you know, that may be, very intimate and personal that feels nice to share because, you know, it's nice to have these online relationships and create connections with people that you haven't, um, you know, have that sort of like friendship feeling in an online world. But if that sort of information comes out too fast, too soon, um, it could then later be used against you in the future. So being aware um, of what kind of information is being shared with this person who fundamentally you think, you know, but they, they could be anyone basically. Um, and also, again, if if boundaries being pushed in terms of them trying to isolate you from friends and family, saying don't tell your friends about me, don't tell your parents about me, you know, any secrets they ask you to keep, all of these sort of things. If something something feels wrong, it's probably best to speak to someone about it, whether that be a friend, a teacher, a parent, a, you know, a coworker, whatever it is, to kind of make sure someone knows about this person's online presence. And if there's a feeling in your gut that's telling you, I don't want people to know I'm talking to this person or I, you know, this, 
I want to keep this just between us sort of thing, that probably means that it's not um, it's not a safe situation because you wouldn't keep it a secret from someone if you met someone at a coffee shop. Yeah. And it's it's even stuff like when you're in these like young online relationships, things that people don't even uh, register as these kind of like manipulation or red flags is things like um, asking you to keep like your snap maps on or share your location with them at all times and stuff like you can't follow these, like you have to unfollow all these people on Instagram or whatever. You have to unfriend people on Facebook or whatever it ends up being, or you can't like so-and-so's photo and stuff like that is those little things that kind of, again, build up to this like manipulative, like power imbalance, which then, you know, in the lens of consent leads to kind of that imbalance. A hundred percent. And I think, um, I think because of a very kind of romanticized view of kind of like Romeo and Juliet teenage love sort of yeah. thing and this kind of like oh super intense super controlling lots of jealousy involved um you know all that sort of thing coercive controlling relationships almost become the norm and yeah if sharing your location with someone you haven't met online big no no yeah yeah 100% yeah um Elliot I'd like to open this part of the conversation up to you do you have much experience um either yourself or with your friends like with any type of online dating, whether that be through traditional apps or um, now it's really common to be online dating through like typical everyday apps like Snapchat or Facebook or Instagram. Do you have any experiences in those spaces? Um, yeah, so I've met, me and my friends have all sort of met people through Snapchat. So because we're all a lot younger, we didn't necessarily use dating apps. You'd meet a friend through Snapchat or you'd go to a party and meet someone and you'd end up talking to them on Snapchat or you'd have a friend of a friend say, oh, you should talk to this person and then you'd communicate through Snapchat rather than conventional sort of dating apps. Um, so that's the sort of new thing in navigating that when that's not the sort of thing your parents had and you wouldn't necessarily ask people about that. Um, but I have friends at uni who are on dating apps and they use it just to get a casual hookup or something. So I don't know if it's as big of a thing in older age groups. But I think it could just be a culture of meeting people and then trying to continue that rather than using a dating app. Learning to be able to gauge what is appropriate for someone to ask you and what's sort of too personal and too too relevant to your like current situation. So where you live, your address or very specific information about you if they're asking random questions like oh what's your favorite color or what's your favorite movie or stuff that's quite surface level I think that's probably a decent way to sort of gauge what is yeah. worth continuing talking to people yeah I think people sort of get stuck in this mindset if you start talking to someone you kind of have to keep talking to them but I think once you figure out or you see something it's better off to just be like no this isn't worth continuing mm. in once you feel uncomfortable it's like there's no need to put any more effort into it. Yeah. The, like at, at being at risk of like yeah. your own safety. It, it can even be as well, like it, it can be as, as extreme as people being overly invasive, but it can also even yeah. be as subtle as people just being overly sexual for no reason it, Yeah. out of nowhere. And then you can kind of, you get this like, you know, yucky feeling in your stomach where you're like, well, this is like, this isn't kind of what I wanted or this isn't kind of what I expected. Like, how do we, and like, I mean, especially it's us, like we're still young as well. Like how do we navigate those kind of situations? That's a really good question. <laughs> I think this is probably a bad way to think about it, but I think if you go through that experience once, you know sort of what not to do next time. And I think having conversations with your friends who might be in similar situations to you, almost learning from other people's mistakes, but being aware of how to not get into those situations, I think, mm. There's certain levels of like, oh, this is just banter to, oh, that's a really obscure comment that you probably shouldn't be making towards another person. I think finding the fine line between yeah. that, oh, okay, that's just a funny joke that they're making or, or that's something that makes me feel really uncomfortable. I think you're right. Like running it, running it by your friend group is such an important kind of step that kind of gives you, because if, if you think you might be like, this is okay, and then you might run it by your friend group and they're like, uh... Yeah, that's like a little bit and then it kind of it gives you that like safety barrier. So I think it's like creating that conversation and kind of talking about it in that way is really important. Mm. I was just going to ask Dante, have you had any experiences of um, any type of, you know, online dating um, casually or not, but any red flags that you personally kind of look out for? I think that um, a, like a big one when you're kind of 
like online dating and especially when you're navigating relationships in this online space is that it's such a um it's it's almost like it's it's live all the time like it's always you're like you're always on and you're, it's not like you see someone and then you're like you don't see them like it's always on and I think that um navigating boundaries when forming those online relationships is really really important like whether that's because uh, manipulation can come kind of in the smallest ways even it's just as oh like you didn't text me in two hours like what have you been doing like you must be da 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 like all of that kind of stuff and kind of like navigating what the boundaries are within your relationship and kind of where your time is going and kind of like navigating that trust as well is like really really important I think yeah absolutely Chanel were you gonna say something about that I was just going to say that the good thing about the online world, whether it's a dating app or Snapchat or, you know, speaking to someone, even if you don't think it's a situation that you're talking about dating and then suddenly it becomes sexual, is that there's the block function. And the good thing about the online world is that, unfortunately, like, you know, lots of feminine identities are socialised to be very bad at saying no and always saying yes and being nice and laughing things off and whatever when you're in person it's a lot easier to do those sort of things. Like someone made a really creepy comment. Someone I opened my bag the other day at a, um, at a club and someone looked in and saw a condom and was like, oh, you're ready to see me tonight. And I literally just like froze up and was like, ha ah, and just like walked away. It was so awkward. But if that was online, because I am like in control, I could press the block function and be like, you're gone now. Um, so yeah, I guess just remembering that that's, um, it seems like really extreme to block someone, but it's completely normal if you've never met someone in person and they're making you feel uncomfortable, you have that right to remove them from your life. I think, I think it's really important as well that like when you're in that online space that you understand how much power you have to control your own online experience. Like we mm. almost have more power than we think we do in that kind of online space where you're not a victim of having to be there and stand there and like run or walk away like physically like you can do all of that stuff with a click of a button and kind of separate yourself from a situation and then go and have a conversation with somebody which I think is yeah. is really important to acknowledge and embrace how much power you have over your own situation. Yeah and there's no immediate danger because they're not there in front of you and you have the yeah space but yeah and of course there's also the e-safety commission if things escalate or if they start contacting you on different platforms. Yep. 100%. Yeah, I'd like to touch on what you said before, um, Chanel, with that anecdote experience of someone making a really sexual comment that was completely un unwarranted and unsolicited. And I think that that's a really unfortunate, there's been a really un unfortunate shift in the culture around um, dating and just general interactions in person and online. These just immediate sexual advances um, without any forewarning or conversation. Um, have you noticed that a lot in while well, working in this kind of space yeah I think um I think it's kind of both because I mean people obviously talk about that because online dating has become such a thing or because you know sliding into someone's dms or like whatever like that broad overview term of online um whatever is so common that people probably feel less comfortable to kind of approach people in person anymore but I think it also means that when someone does approach someone in person, it's kind of very like straight to the point. And there's, I don't know, there's times that it can um, be done well, like, you know, someone can give you their number or whatever like that. And that could be like nice and lovely or they can, you know, you can be smiling and having a nice chat and you can still tell someone's flirting with you. But yeah, that guy was obviously like to like the audacity for the first thing he said to me the first thing that comes out of his mouth is to imply that I brought a condom out specifically to have sex with him. So Dante as a man how would you go about having a conversation with friends who are behaving inappropriately or making untoward sexual advances to someone sending yeah. unsolicited photos yeah. any of that kind of behavior how would you yeah. go about starting those conversations? I think it's a it's a I think it's a really important conversation that almost isn't had enough between groups of young men especially um, and I think it comes, it, a lot of it comes from a place of like peer pressure and weird, like, like pecking order, like group dominance. And it, it all comes from a place of trying to find your place in insecurity at the end of the day. And I think that what I'm like, what I'm getting at, what I'm trying to say that is that none of the, and if I was speaking to young males, like if they were watching or if I'm like giving advice to people, I'm saying that none of the, the, the behavior that you feel like you're doing to impress the guys who you were with none of them individually think it's okay and neither do you individually and if you just the 
however many of you just got in a circle and had a conversation about what you actually think is okay and what you actually think is right, you would all actually agree that none of it is okay. And it generally comes from a place of not talking and not having that conversation and everybody thinking that everybody else thinks it's okay, when in reality, nobody does. Mm. <laughs> and so it's just about starting that conversation and having that conversation with friends, just being like, just being like, hey man, like that was out of line. Or just like little things, like, like, just a little nod or like a little, like a little knock just to reinforce the fact with them that like that behavior is not okay. Like it, you don't have to, you know, like go up and have like a massive lecture. You just have to be like, Hey, like, that's not cool. Like, don't, we don't do that. Like, that's not okay. And then, and if it's your friend, like they're going to take that from you. They're not going to get like, they're not going to get angry at you. They're going to take that from you and they're going to really take it on. Mm. So why do you think in the, well, when you said that individually they would, might know it's wrong, but together like that herd mentality that they feel like that they have to believe that, that it is okay. Yeah. What, what, what do you think are the reasons that are driving why they think it's okay in the first place? I, I don't know. I think like that's a, it's a really deep question. I think it comes down to education especially. Um, and I think that like the stuff that Chanel is doing will be amazing for that in schools and teaching that in young males especially really, really early. Um, and a lot of it is like kind of comes from that place of toxic masculinity where like you like it's just been brought up. They learn it from their dad who learned it from their dad who learned it from their dad. And I think that our generation especially is in a really important time where we are like on the cusp of kind of shifting that movement and changing that movement. And I think that it is just it's just up to us as like young males, especially within your friend groups, especially if you're, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17 to just have those conversations, have a sit down, like serious conversation with your friends. The reason that, um, you know, it needed exposing is because we had normalised this behaviour and, you know, trying to make sure that people in general understood that, um, you know, if you're a girl, a non-binary person or a feminine identity, being exposed to sexual violence is kind of part of your everyday life. Um, and this comes from very strict expectations and attitudes towards gender and sexuality and what that looks like and how people believe that should be played out in sexual situations. Um, so I guess the reason that this herd mentality occurs is because one, it's normal to us. Um, you know, right now we live in a rape culture where it's more normal to make someone feel uncomfortable, harass them online or, um, you know, approach them inappropriately than it is to call out a friend for doing that because we have a culture that has enabled violence to thrive in this way. Um, the other reason is because of, yeah, when um, when toxic masculinity is prevalent, which it is in Australia and which it is in these all boys um, schools as a general rule, you get social status and, um, you know, comfort from being part of a group. And in order to be part of that group, there's a few things that need to be done in order to conform to society's ideas of masculinity. And one of those things includes the objectification and sexualization of women and other feminine identities. So once we start deconstructing that and having those conversations, as you said, Dante, individually, I don't think people necessarily want to engage in these conversations, but it's unfortunately a lot harder to call out a rape joke than it is um, than it is to just like laugh and look a little bit awkward and go along with it and think about it when you get home but no one else said anything so why would you say anything um, so yeah we need to start breaking that and it only it only takes a few doesn't even need to be the majority of people who are willing to break that in order for it to change it just needs to be kind of a loud minority because that's what it is at the moment that's the people we are perpetrating these things yeah and you talk about these kind of like toxically masculine like behaviors how does that how does that kind of look in an online space because because you, you get a lot of that like in person it's kind of really easy to identify but what might that look like in kind of an online lens where you might not even really be thinking about it but that's kind of that is kind of where it comes from yeah 100 percent. i mean we've, we've just yet yeah, again translated the real world into the online world and kind of scaled the amount of um, violence that can potentially be experienced by someone. So I think if we think about, um, okay, let's think about catcalling, for example, it's a very common experience for pretty much anyone that is perceived by women by society. And what catcalling is, is ultimately an intrusion. It's ultimately someone else feeling as though they are allowed to intrude in your space for a short period of time, whether they're thinking about it or not subconsciously, they feel as though they're allowed to do that. Um, what they're getting from that is power and authority to a microaggression that, you know, continues the social hierarchy of the fact that 
women or feminine identities are subordinate to men um, or, or cis men, not even other masculine identities, just cis men. And what um, what's happened is now, for example, there's been lots of research into why, um, why men send unsolicited dick pics so frequently and we can understand that as another form of intrusion. It's a, um, another microaggression that means that one person doesn't respect the authority and space of another and um, feels entitled to their space in that way. And instead of through a verbal comment and suddenly now through like a quiet graphic um, and disturbing images. And in uh, trying to understand why and who sends unsolicited dick pics where that consent is con- consent is void, um, it basically comes down to power and again, assertion of um, upholding kind of social hierarchy. And it's been found that a, a lot of the type people who send on the dick pics are actually taking control back of the courtship process where we've normalized, um, where we've normalized. So I'm talking about a heterosexual encounter here where we've normalized women being proactive in um, their own sexual identities and trying to remove taboos around them. This is a way of, again, taking power back. Well, something I've noticed a lot in this campaign from having lots of conversations with people, I don't know, maybe you will agree or not, is so often people don't report to protect themselves or to get justice for their own act, like the only the thing that happened to them, because um, I think especially, again, girls who are socialised um, or people socialised as girls are so used to kind of being like submissive and not caring and kind of copying all this stuff, but constantly doing things like reporting or speaking up or doing for this idea of other people to like protect future potential people in that space. Um, And I think that we need to remember that not only are we protecting other people when we report things, but it's actually valid for us to protect ourselves and remove these specific people from, from our lives. But I don't, I don't know what you'll think about that. Yeah. And, and like, again, we talk about like blocking someone's social media, but that can, come in a variety of ways as well and it's named differently across platforms whether that's a block or it's like a mute or it's an unad or it's an unfriend all of that sort of stuff and it comes back to kind of like controlling which is a good thing about the online space where you can kind of try to as much as you can control kind of what you see and what you're and who you interact with you can control that because obviously there is no immediate danger and you can kind of put a barrier in there and that goes one step further as well for you know, you may not need to block someone, but it may be good for your mental health. Like it doesn't need to necessarily yeah. be something that's, you know, a, like active abuse for it to, for you to decide that you need to tone down your interaction with someone. Yeah, and I think it's a good point that you raised there about reporting or talking to someone about any instance of anything that makes you feel uncomfortable. Um, I, I do think it is um, a common thing that people feel um, as though that they will be judged or they'll be shamed or criticised for their actions if they come forward. And if it's, especially if it's about something sexual, um, talking to someone that you trust can be really, really difficult. Um, So how would you suggest people go about finding someone that they really trust um, to seek help? The thing, the thing that I, so I'm just going to go back to like the classic example of um, let's do, that's a classic example of like you're you send a nude to someone and then that gets non-consensually shared to another group of people and then suddenly you've experienced image-based abuse. I think we need to as a society start flipping the um flipping the problem on the person who originally shared that image and talking about but what we need to start focusing on is when consent is violated. So when that can, like when those images are sent on to people, because so often um, I'll speak to mainly young girls and they'll tell me, um, you know, I was, the way they describe it, they're essentially describing coercion to me without knowing they're describing coercion to me. They say, oh, they said they would break up with me if I didn't do this. And I'm thinking, well, it's not your fault you sent that photo because you were coerced into doing it. And then now that it's been sent on to a whole group chat of people and everyone in the school seen it, they feel as though they can't report because of shame, um, because their parents probably potentially won't understand why this photo was ever originally sent in the first place, because police have to get involved, because the online um monographic content and all that stuff and these conversations happen in the UK and I always feel so helpless because I don't know what I can tell these people because if they do report to teachers they will be 
place involved because it is a serious issue. But in Australia, it's so refreshing to be able to um, speak to young people about this because the eSafety Commission's office has tools where you can report, um, you know, you can report to them, which means if you have no one in your life that you want to speak to about this situation, even though I really hope that everyone does. I, I, I mean, I think if I was 14 and this happened to me, I would have been absolutely mortified. Um, it's important that everyone knows that they have that avenue to go down if they're experiencing image-based abuse or if their friends experience imaging-based abuse in any way, because although most people have friends to go to, sometimes you're also just, just as uninformed. Yeah. And I think it's important too, because we've talked about this in some of the other stuff we have done with eSafety, is that um, for image-based abuse specifically, you don't have to report to the platform. You don't have to, like, there's no middleman. You can take it immediately. You can take it straight to eSafety um, and they can work on it from there. Mm. And I think it's really important to note as well that um, image sharing doesn't even have to happen before you take it to eSafety. And like you were mentioning with coercion or threats or blackmail, that all is covered and you don't need to wait for that and you can take action. And so I think that's really important that um, everybody is aware that there is something like this that exists and that it can, yeah, you, you don't need to, to wait for it to get to um, image base um, abuse for, for you to take it further. So Ellie, I'd like to um, talk to you a little bit about this. Have you had any experience yourself or with friends um, that have been coerced into sending any kind of sexual image to someone? Um, not that I know of, but because of having been friends with people who are girls and who experience that sort of stuff. There's a lot of shame around that. So there probably is at least one person I know that has experienced that, but due to the shame in society with that sort of stuff, I haven't had any of those sort of conversations with my friends about that. Um, but I think if having more conversations about that sort of stuff will make it easier for people to be able to talk about it and be able to get help in those situations and understand what they're doing and with the work Chanel does all of the infographics and all that stuff allows people to know more about the situation that they've been in and like be able to process what's going on and then help other people know what's going on and sort of the cycle of like understanding what's happening and how to sort of stop that with other people I think. Absolutely and I think it's important to note that with e-safety um, in terms of reporting to them you don't have to wait uh, for there to be any kind of image-based abuse. If you're being threatened to send nudes or pressured by someone to send any kind of illicit content, you can report it directly to eSafety, which is really, really important for young people. So I think that wraps up our conversation for today. So thank you so much, Dante, and for Elliot for joining us, um, the Scroll team, having a really important chat about some really important topics. And also I wanna say thank you to Chanel for joining us today, I'm taking the time to yeah, have, have a conversation with us about um, some really important topics and for her to share the amazing work that she's doing um, for everybody in Australia. Thank you so much for having me here today. It was so great to speak with all of you about this. Conversations are really important in this space and young people are disproportionately affected by instances of image-based abuse with two thirds of reports that go through the eSafety Commissioner's Office being um, from people who are under 25 years old. So everyone make sure that you go out and have a conversation with friends about what you heard today and what you've learnt and start to remove those taboos so that we can keep each other safe. Bye guys, Thank thanks for watching, yeah. bye.